Chapter 10 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 10 The Swede. As the warriors clustered thick about Tarzan and Sheeta realized that it was a flesh and blood panther that had interrupted their dance of death, they took heart a trifle for in the face of all those circling spears even the mighty Sheeta would be doomed. Rokoff was urging the chief to have his spearmen launch their missiles, and the black was upon the instant of issuing the command when his eyes strayed beyond Tarzan, following the gaze of the ape-man. With a yell of terror the chief turned and fled towards the village gate, and as his people looked to see the cause of his fright, they too took to their heels, for there, lumbering down upon them, their huge forms exaggerated by the play of moonlight and campfire, came the hideous apes of a cut. The instant the natives turned to flee, the ape-man's savage cry rang out above the shrieks of the blacks, and in answer to it, Sheeta and the apes leaped growling after the fugitives. Some of the warriors turned to battle with their enraged antagonist, but before the fiendish ferocity of the fierce beast they went down to bloody death. Others were dragged down in their flight, and it was not until the village was empty and the last of the blacks had disappeared into the bush that Tarzan was able to recall his savage pack to his side. Then it was that he discovered to his chagrin that he could not make one of them, not even the comparatively intelligent Akut, understand that he wished to be freed from the bonds that held him to the stake. In time, of course, the idea would filter through their thick skulls, but in the meanwhile many things might happen. The blacks might return in force to regain their village. The whites might readily pick them all off with their rifles from the surrounding trees. He might even starve to death before the dull-witted apes realized that he wished them to gnaw through his bonds. As for Sheeta, the great cat understood even less than the apes, but yet Tarzan could not but marvel at the remarkable characteristics this beast had evidenced. That it felt real affection for him there seemed little doubt, for now that the blacks were disposed of it walked slowly back and forth about the stake, rubbing its sides against the ape-man's legs, and purring like a contented tabby. That it had gone of its own volition to bring the balance of the pack to his rescue, Tarzan could not doubt. His Sheeta was indeed a jewel among beasts. Mungambi's absence worried the ape-man not a little. He attempted to learn from Akut what had become of the black. Fearing that the beast, freed from the restraint of Tarzan's present, might have fallen upon the man and devoured him, but to all his questions the great ape but pointed back in the direction from which they had come out of the jungle. The night passed with Tarzan still fast bound to the stake, and shortly after dawn his fears were realized in the discovery of naked black figures moving stealthily just within the edge of the jungle about the village the blacks were returning. With daylight, their courage would be equal to the demands of a charge upon the handful of beasts that had routed them from their rightful abodes. The result of the encounter seemed foregone if the savages could curb their superstitious terror, for against their overwhelming numbers, their long spears and poisoned arrows, the panther and the apes could not be expected to survive a really determined attack. That the blacks were preparing for a charge became apparent a few moments later, when they commenced to show themselves in force upon the edge of the clearing dancing and jumping about as they waved their spears and shouted taunts and fierce war cries toward the village. These maneuvers, Tarzan knew, would continue until the blacks had worked themselves into a state of hysterical courage sufficient to sustain them for a short charge toward the village. And even though he doubted that they would reach it at first attempt, he believed that at the second or the third they would swarm through the gateway, when the outcome could not be aught than the extermination of Tarzan's bold but unarmed and undisciplined defenders. Even as he had guessed, the first charge carried the howling warriors but a short distance into the open, a shrill, weird challenge from the ape-man being all that was necessary to send them scurrying back to the bush. For half an hour they pranced and yelled their courage to the sticking point, and again essayed a charge. This time they came quite to the village gate, but when Sheeta and the hideous apes leaped among them, they turned screaming in terror, and again fled into the jungle. Again was the dancing and shouting repeated. This time Tarzan felt no doubt that they would enter the village and complete the work that a handful of determined white men would have carried to a successful conclusion at the first attempt. To have rescue come so close, only to be thwarted because he could not make his poor, savage friends understand precisely what he wanted of them was most irritating. But he could not find it in his heart to place blame upon them. They had done their best, and now he was sure they would doubtless remain to die with him in a fruitless effort to defend him. The blacks were already preparing for the charge. A few individuals had advanced a short distance toward the village, and were exhorting the others to follow them. In a moment the whole savage horde would be racing across the clearing. 
Tarzan thought only of the little child somewhere in this cruel, relentless wilderness. His heart ached for the son that he might no longer seek to save, and that the realization of Jane's suffering were all that weighed upon his brave spirit in these that he thought his last moments of life. Succor, all that he could hope for, had come to him in the instant of his extremity, and failed. There was nothing further for which to hope. The blacks were halfway across the clearing when Tarzan's attention was attracted by the actions of one of the apes. The beast was glaring toward one of the huts. Tarzan followed his gaze. To his infinite relief and delight he saw the stalwart form of Mungambi racing toward him. The huge black was panting heavily, as though from strenuous physical exertion and nervous excitement. He rushed to Tarzan's side, and as the first of the savages reached the village gate, the native's knife severed the last of the cords that bound Tarzan to the stake. In the street lay the corpses of the savages that had fallen before the pack the night before. From one of these Tarzan seized a spear and knobstick, and with Mugambi at his side and the snarling pack about him, he met the natives as they poured through the gate. Fierce and terrible was the battle that ensued, but at last the savages were routed, more by terror perhaps at sight of a black man and a white fighting in company with a panther and the huge fierce apes of a cut, than because of their inability to overcome the relatively small force that opposed them. One prisoner fell into the hands of Tarzan, and him the ape-man questioned in an effort to learn what had become of Rokoff and his party. Promised his liberty in return for the information, the black told all he knew concerning the movements of the Russian. It seemed that early in the morning their chief had attempted to prevail upon the whites to return with him to the village and with their guns destroy the ferocious pack that had taken possession of it, but Rokoff appeared to entertain even more fears of the giant white man and his savage companions than even the blacks themselves. Upon no conditions would he consent to returning even within sight of the village. Instead, he took his party hurriedly to the river, where they stole a number of canoes the blacks had hidden there. The last that they had seen of them, they had been paddling strongly upstream, their porters from Kaviri's village wielding the blades. So once more Tarzan of the Apes with his hideous pack took up his search for the ape-man's son and the pursuit of his abductor. For weary days they followed through an almost uninhabited country, only to learn at last that they were upon the wrong trail. The little band had been reduced by three, for three of Akut's apes had fallen in the fighting at the village. Now with Akut there were five great apes, and Sheeta was there, and Mungambi and Tarzan. The ape-man no longer heard rumors even of the three who had preceded Rokoff, the white man and the woman and the child. Who the man and woman were he could not guess, but that the child was his was enough to keep him hot upon the trail. He was sure that Rokoff would be following this trio and so he felt confident that so long as he could keep upon the Russian's trail, he would be winning so much nearer to the time he might snatch his son from the dangers and horrors that menaced him. In retracing their way after losing Rokoff's trail, Tarzan picked it up again at a point where the Russian had left the river and taken to the brush in a northerly direction. He could only account for this change on the ground that the child had been carried away from the river by the two who now had possession of it. Nowhere along the way, however, could he gain definite information that might assure him positively that the child was ahead of him. Not a single native they questioned had seen or heard of this other party, though nearly all had direct experience with the Russian or had talked with others who had. It was with difficulty that Tarzan could find means to communicate with the natives, as the moment their eyes fell upon his companions they fled precipitously into the bush. His only alternative was to go ahead of his pack and waylay an occasional warrior whom he found alone in the jungle. One day as he was thus engaged, tracking an unsuspecting savage, he came upon the fellow in the act of hurling a spear at a wounded white man who crouched in a clump of bush at the trail's side. The white was one whom Tarzan had often seen, and whom he recognized at once. Deep in his memory was implanted those repulsive features, the close-set eyes, the shifty expression, the drooping yellow mustache. Instantly it occurred to the ape-man that this fellow had not been among those who had accompanied Rokoff at the village where Tarzan had been a prisoner. He had seen them all, and this fellow had not been there. There could be but one explanation. He it was who had fled ahead of the Russian with the woman and the child, and the woman had been Jane Clayton. He was sure now of the meaning of Rokoff's words. The ape-man's face went white as he looked upon the pasty, vice-marked countenance of the Swede. Across Tarzan's forehead stood out the broad band of scarlet that marked the scar where, years before, Turkaz had torn a great strip of the ape-man's scalp from his skull in the fierce battle in which Tarzan had sustained his fitness to the kingship of the apes of Kerchak. The man was his prey. The black should not have him, and with the thought he leaped upon the warrior, striking down the spear before it could reach its mark. The black, whipping out his knife, turned to do battle with this new enemy, while the Swede, lying in the bush, 
witnessed a duel the like of which he had never dreamed to see, a half-naked white man battling with a half-naked black, hand to hand with the crude weapons of primeval man at first, and then with hands and teeth like the primordial brutes from whose loins their forebears sprung. For a time Anderson did not recognize the white, and then at last it dawned upon him that he had seen this giant before. His eyes went wide in surprise that this growling, rending beast could ever have been the well-groomed English gentleman who had been a prisoner aboard the Kincaid. An English nobleman. He had learned the identity of the Kincaid's prisoners from Lady Greystoke during their flight up the Ungambi. Before, in common with the other members of the crew of the steamer, he had not known who the two might be. The fight was over. Tarzan had been compelled to kill his antagonist, as the fellow would not surrender. The Swede saw the white man leap to his feet beside the corpse of his foe, and placing one foot upon the broken neck, lift his voice in the hideous challenge of the victorious bull ape. Anderson shuddered. Then Tarzan turned toward him. His face was cold and cruel, and in the gray eyes the Swede read murder. "'Where is my wife?' growled the ape-man. "'Where is the child?' Anderson tried to reply, but a sudden fit of coughing choked him. There was an arrow entirely through his chest and as he coughed the blood from his wounded lung poured suddenly from his mouth and nostrils. Tarzan stood waiting for the paroxysm to pass. Like a bronze image, cold, hard, and relentless, he stood over the helpless man, waiting to wring such information from him as he needed, and then to kill. Presently the coughing and hemorrhaging ceased, and again the wounded man tried to speak. Tarzan knelt near the faintly moving lips. The wife and child, he repeated. Where are they? Anderson pointed up the trail. The Russian. He got them, he whispered. How did you come here? continued Tarzan. Why are you not with Rokoff? They catch us, replied Anderson, in a voice so low that the ape-man could just distinguish the words. They catch us. I fight. But my men, they all run away. Then they get me when I been wounded. Rokoff say he leave me here for the hyenas. That was worse than to kill. He take your wife and kid. What were you doing with them? Where were you taking them? asked Tarzan, and then, fiercely leaping close to the fellow with fierce eyes blazing with the passion of hate and vengeance that he had with difficulty controlled. What harm did you do to my wife or child? Speak quick before I kill you. Make your peace with God. Tell me the worst or I will tear you to pieces with my hands and teeth. You have seen that I can do it. A look of wide-eyed surprise overspread Anderson's face. Why? he whispered. I did not hurt them. I tried to save them from that Russian. Your wife was kind to me on the Kincaid, and I hear that little baby cry sometimes. I got a wife and kid for my own by Christiana, and I couldn't bear for to see them separated and in Rokoff's hands any more. That was all. Do I look like I've been here to hurt them? He continued after a pause, pointing to the arrow protruding from his breast. There was something in the man's tone and expression that convinced Tarzan of the truth of his assertions. More weighty than anything else was the fact that Anderson evidently seemed more hurt than frightened. He knew he was going to die, so Tarzan's threats had little effect upon him. But it was quite apparent that he wished the Englishman to know the truth, and not to wrong him by harboring the belief that his words and manner indicated that he had entertained. The ape-man instantly dropped to his knees beside the Swede. "'I am sorry,' he said very simply. "'I had looked for none but knaves in company with Rokoff. I see that I was wrong.' That is past now, and we will drop it for the more important matter of getting you to a place of comfort and for looking after your wounds. We must have you on your feet again as soon as possible. Then the Swede, smiling, shook his head. You go on and look for the wife and kid, he said. I've been as good as dead already, but, he hesitated, I hate to think of the hyenas. Won't you finish up this job? Tarzan shuddered. A moment ago he had been upon the point of killing this man. Now he could no more have taken his life than he could have taken the life of any of his best friends. He lifted the Swede's head in his arms to change and ease his position. Again came a fit of coughing and the terrible hemorrhage. After it was over, Anderson lay with closed eyes. Tarzan thought that he was dead, until he suddenly raised his eyes to those of the ape-man, sighed, and spoke in a very low, weak whisper. "'I think it blow pretty soon, pretty hard,' he said, and died. End of chapter 10